Chapter 18 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 18 Sola's Story. Once within the palace, I drew Sola to the dining hall, and when she had greeted her father after the formal manner of the green men, she told the story of the pilgrimage and capture of Deja Thoris. Seven days ago, after her audience with Zad Aras, Deja Thoris attempted to slip from the palace in the dead of night. Although I had not heard the outcome of her interview with Zad Aras, I knew that something had occurred then to cause her the keenest mental agony, and when I discovered her creeping from the palace, I did not need to be told her destination. Hastily arousing a dozen of her most faithful gods, I explained my fears to them, and as one they enlisted with me to follow our beloved princess in her wanderings, even to the sacred Is and the valley door. We came upon her but a short distance from the palace. With her was faithful Wula the hound, but none other. When we overtook her she feigned anger and ordered us back to the palace, but for once we disobeyed her and when she found that we would not let her go upon the last long pilgrimage alone, she wept and embraced us, and together we went out into the night toward the south. The following day we came upon a herd of small thoats, and thereafter we were mounted and made good time. We traveled very fast and very far due south, until the morning of the fifth day we sighted a great fleet of battleships sailing north. They saw us before we could seek shelter and soon we were surrounded by a horde of black men. The princess's guard fought nobly to the end, but they were soon overcome and slain. Only Deja Thoris and I were spared. When she realized that she was in the clutches of the black pirates, she attempted to take her own life, but one of the blacks tore her dagger from her, and then they bound us both so that we could not use our hands. The fleet continued north after capturing us, there were about twenty large battleships in all, besides a number of small swift cruisers. That evening one of the smaller cruisers that had been far in advance of the fleet returned with a prisoner, a young red woman whom they had picked up in a range of hills under the very noses, they said, of a fleet of three red Martian battleships. From scraps of conversation which we overheard, it was evident that the black pirates were searching for a party of fugitives that had escaped from them several days prior. That they considered the capture of the young woman important was evident from the long and earnest interview the commander of the fleet held with her when she was brought to him. Later she was bound and placed in the compartment with Deja Thoris and myself. The new captive was a very beautiful girl. She told Deja Thoris that many years ago she had taken the voluntary pilgrimage from the court of her father, the Jeddak of Ptarth. She was Thuvia, the princess of Tarth. And then she asked Deja Thoris who she might be, and when she heard she fell upon her knees and kissed Deja Thoris' fettered hands, and told her that that very morning she had been with John Carter, princess of Helium, and Carthoris her son. Deja Thoris could not believe her at first, but finally, when the girl had narrated all the strange adventures that had befallen her since she had met John Carter, and told her of the things John Carter and Carthoris and Zodar had narrated of their adventures in the land of the firstborn, Deja Thoris knew that it could be none other than the Prince of Helium. For who, she said, upon all Barsoom, other than John Carter, could have done the deeds you tell of? and then Thuvia told Deja Thoris of her love for John Carter, and his loyalty and devotion to the princess of his choice. Deja Thoris broke down and wept. Cursing Zat Aris and the cruel fate that had driven her from Helium but a few brief days before the return of her beloved lord. "'I do not blame you for loving him, Thuvia,' she said, "'and that your affection for him is pure and sincere, I can well believe,' from the candor of your avowal of it to me. The fleet continued north nearly to Helium, but last night they evidently realized that John Carter had indeed escaped them, and so they turned toward the south once more. Shortly thereafter a guard entered our compartment and dragged me to the deck. 
There is no place in the land of the firstborn for a green one, he said, and with that he gave me a terrific shove that carried me toppling from the deck of the battleship. Evidently this seemed to him the easiest way of ridding the vessel of my presence and killing me at the same time. But a kind fate intervened, and by a miracle I escaped with but slight bruises. The ship was moving slowly at the time, and as I lunged overboard into the darkness beneath, I shuddered at the awful plunge I thought awaited me, for all day the fleet had sailed thousands of feet above the ground. But to my utter surprise, I struck upon a soft mass of vegetation not twenty feet from the deck of the ship. In fact, the keel of the vessel must have been grazing the surface of the ground at the time. I lay all night where I had fallen, and next morning brought an explanation of the fortunate coincidence that had saved me from a terrible death. As the sun rose, I saw a vast panorama of sea-bottom and distant hills lying far below me. I was upon the highest peak of a lofty range. The fleet in the darkness of the preceding night had barely grazed the crest of the hills, and in the brief span that they hovered close to the surface, the black guard had pitched me, as he supposed, to my death. A few miles west of me was a great waterway. When I reached it, I found to my delight that it belonged to helium. Here a thought was procured for me. The rest you know. For many minutes none spoke. Deja Thoris in the clutches of the firstborn. I shuddered at the thought, but of a sudden the old fire of unconquerable self-confidence surged through me. I sprang to my feet, and with back-thrown shoulders and upraised sword took a solemn vow to reach, rescue, and revenge my princess. A hundred swords leapt from a hundred scabbards, and a hundred fighting men sprang to the tabletop and pledged me their lives and fortunes to the expedition. Already my plans were formulated. I thanked each loyal friend, and, leaving Carthoris to entertain them, withdrew to my own audience chamber with Cantos Khan, Tars Tarkas, Zodar, and Horvastus. Here we discussed the details of our expedition until long after dark. Zodar was positive that Issus would choose both Dejah Thoris and Thuvia to serve her for a year. For that length of time, at least, they will be comparatively safe, he said, and we will at least know where to look for them. In the matter of equipping a fleet to enter Omin, the details were left to Kantos Khan and Zodar. The former agreed to take such vessels as we required into dock as rapidly as possible, where Zodar would direct their equipment with water propellers. For many years, the Black had been in charge of the refitting of captured battleships that they might navigate Omin, and so was familiar with the construction of the propellers, housings, and the auxiliary gearing required. It was estimated that it would require six months to complete our preparations in view of the fact that the utmost secrecy must be maintained to keep the project from the ears of Zat Aris. Kantos Khan was confident now that the man's ambitions were fully aroused, and that nothing short of the title of Jeddak of Helium would satisfy him. I doubt, he said, if he would even welcome Dejah Thoris' return, for it would mean another nearer the throne than he. With you and Carthoris out of the way, there would be little to prevent him from assuming the title of Jeddak, and you may rest assured that, so long as he is supreme here, there is no safety for either of you." "'There is a way,' cried Horvastus, to thwart him effectually and forever." "'What?' I asked. He smiled. "'I shall whisper it here, but some day I shall stand upon the dome of the Temple of Reward and shout it to cheering multitudes below.' "'What do you mean?' asked Kantos Khan. "'John Carter, Jeddak of Helium,' said Horvastus in a low voice. The eyes of my companions lighted, and grim smiles of pleasure and anticipation overspread their faces, as each eye turned toward me questioningly. But I shook my head. "'No, my friends,' I said, smiling. "'I thank you, but it cannot be. "'Not yet, at least.' When we know that Tardos Mors and Mors Kajak are gone to return no more, if I be here, then I shall join you all to see that the people of Helium are permitted to choose fairly their next Jeddak. 
whom they choose, may count upon the loyalty of my sword, nor shall I seek the honor for myself. Until then, Tardos Mors is Jeddak of Helium, and Zat Aras is his representative. As you will, John Carter, said Horvastus. But what was that? he whispered, pointing toward the window overlooking the gardens. The words were scarce out of his mouth ere he had sprung to the balcony without. There he goes! he cried excitedly. The guards! Below there! The guards! We were close behind him, and all saw the figure of a man run quickly across a little piece of sward and disappear in the shrubbery beyond. He was on the balcony when I first saw him, cried Horvastus. Quick, let us follow him. Together we ran to the gardens, but even though we scoured the grounds with the entire guard for hours, no trace could we find of the night marauder. What do you make of it, Kantos Khan? asked Tars Tarkas. A spy sent by Zat Aris, he replied. It was ever his way. He will have something interesting to report to his master, then, laughed Horvastus. I hope he heard only our references to a new Jeddak, I said. If he overheard our plans to rescue Dejah Thoris, it will mean civil war, for he will attempt to thwart us, and in that I will not be thwarted. There would I turn against Tardos Mors himself were it necessary. If it throws all helium into a bloody conflict, I shall go on with these plans to save my princess. Nothing shall stay me now short of death. And should I die, my friends, will you take the oath to prosecute the search for her and bring her back in safety to her grandfather's court? Upon the hilt of his sword each of them swore to do as I had asked. It was agreed that the battleships that were to be remodeled should be ordered to Hastor, another heliumetic city, far to the southwest. Kantos Khan thought that the docks there, in addition to their regular work, would accommodate at least six battleships at a time. As he was commander-in-chief of the navy, it would be a simple matter for him to order the vessels there as they could be handled, and thereafter keep the remodeled fleet in remote parts of the empire until we should be ready to assemble it for the dash upon Omin. It was late that night before our conference broke up but each man there had his particular duties outlined, and the details of the entire plan had been mapped out. Kantos Khan and Zodar were to attend to the remodeling of the ships. Tars Tarkas was to get into communication with Thark and learn the sentiments of his people toward his return from Dor. If favorable, he was to repair immediately to Thark and devote his time to the assembling of a great horde of green warriors, whom it was our plan to send in transports directly to the Valley Dor and the Temple of Issus, while the fleet entered Omin and destroyed the vessels of the firstborn. Upon Horvastus devolved the delicate mission of organizing a secret force of fighting men, sworn to follow John Carter wherever he might lead. As we estimated that it would require over a million men to man the thousand great battleships we intended to use on Omin, and the transports for the green men, as well as the ships that were to convoy the transports, it was no trifling job that Horvastus had before him. After they had left, I bid Carthoris good night, for I was very tired, and going to my own apartments, bathed and laid down upon my sleeping silks and furs, for the first good night's sleep I had had an opportunity to look forward to since I had returned to Barsoom but even now I was to be disappointed. How long I slept I do not know. When I awoke suddenly it was to find a half-dozen powerful men upon me, a gag already in my mouth, and a moment later my arms and legs securely bound. So quickly had they worked, and to such good purpose, that I was utterly beyond the power to resist them by the time I was fully awake. Never a word spoke they, and the gag effectually prevented me speaking. Silently they lifted me and bore me toward the door of my chamber. As they passed the window through which the farther moon was casting its brilliant beams, I saw that each of the party had his face swathed in layers of silk. I could not recognize one of them. When they had come into the corridor with me, 
they turned toward a secret panel in the wall which led to the passage that terminated in the pits beneath the palace. That any knew of this panel outside my own household I was doubtful. Yet the leader of the band did not hesitate a moment. He stepped directly to the panel, touched the concealed button, and as the door swung open he stood aside while his companions entered with me. Then he closed the panel behind him and followed us. Down through the passageways to the pits we went. The leader rapped upon it with the hilt of his sword. Three quick, sharp blows, a pause, then three more, another pause, then two. A second later the wall swung in, and I was pushed within a brilliantly lighted chamber in which sat three richly trapped men. One of them turned toward me with a sardonic smile upon his thin, cruel lips. It was Zat Aris. End of chapter 18